Before I stand in the middle, I just want to salute the team who've organised this. They have been absolutely amazing. And I'm sure by the end of the day we'll be thanking them lots, but I just wanted to start the day by doing that. I was one of a big family. I had four big brothers, and I was always trying to impress them. When I was about 11, I learned to fire a shotgun. I thought I was incredibly clever. I took the gun out into the woods, and I saw a nest high up in the trees. I pointed the gun straight upwards and pulled the trigger. Sticks rained down on me, bits of shell, bits of embryo chick, and the sky blue feathers of the mother bird. I had killed a beautiful blue jay. I was so shocked by what I'd done that I took the gun home, put it away and never touched it again. About 40 years later, I found myself in the midst of the war in Bosnia, in former Yugoslavia. And I was sitting at the bedside of a man who had been shot by a sniper through both eyes. The bullet went in here and came out here. And I fell to thinking about the man who had pulled the trigger. The sights, the trigger, the squeeze, the single shot, which he probably then forgot. And what happened to the man in the bed? The desperate raising of funds to send him to a surgeon in Italy. The struggle to save both his eyes, to save one eye. Failure, blindness, poverty. Now, most of the wounds of war do not heal for three generations. Maybe not even then. But war, I don't think, is even the biggest violence of our times now. I think it's the gap between rich and poor. Here's a stat that stopped me in my tracks. The 300 richest people in the world now have more wealth than the 3 billion poorest. That's half the world's population, nearly. And furthermore, the 100 wealthiest people in the world made more money last year than could end extreme poverty in the world four times over. So I'll come back to them in a minute, but first, a massive paradox. We've got the skills, we've got the experience, we've got the money, we've got the communications to end world poverty and to bring an end to violence. What we don't yet have is the consciousness. We don't yet have the will to do it. And this leap in consciousness, this ability to rise above the world that we live in and see what's necessary to be done and do it, is now what's missing. But I believe that it may be just beginning. You know what Einstein said? Einstein said, you can't solve a problem from the consciousness that, create, that created it. And Einstein was right. I believe it's just beginning to emerge. People, old and young, are now pouring into the streets of cities across the world to oppose oppression and ruthlessness. Great online campaigns like Avaz, that's A-V-A-A-Z, I'm sure most of you know it, are growing by one million subscribers a month. And they're taking on tough issues and targeting them and getting results. You remember that Bangladeshi garment factory that collapsed, um, killing a thousand people? Avaz uh, took took sides with three workers' unions to build a worker safety agreement that would be enforceable. And then they targeted two of the retail giants that buy from those factories. Yeah. Within three days, that those two retail giants had signed up. Within another two days, 75 other retailers had signed up. That's a result. And that underlines what we found in Peace Direct, 
When we started it in 1999, we did a survey of all the people, local people in their own communities who were preventing or resolving conflict in hot conflict areas. And we were able to count up 350 such initiatives that were viable, that were really effective. Now, if we were to do the same research, it would be five times that many. So a growth of five times in 14 years. And this is a movement that's spreading fast. These are people who are risking their lives so other people don't get killed. Let me give you an example. Henri Bura Ladi was a child soldier in the Congo. And when he escaped from being a child soldier, he decided to devote his life to freeing others. So when Peace Direct sends him a small amount of money, he gets on his motorbike, rides into the bush, and buys goats. And he herds the goats to where the militia are hiding. He knows where they are. And that in itself is taking his life in his hands because the militia are trigger-happy, high on drugs, and allergic to intruders. Henri trades one goat, price $5 for one child, and brings the children back to their families. And then begins the hard job of reintegrating those children with their communities, given what they've suffered. Now, um, what is it that's, that's happening here? What, what is it that we're locating? It's people who are willing to look into the darkness that surrounds them, whether it's in London or anywhere else in the world, and use their imagination to think what a better world could be like. And it starts with imagination. What if we decided to design a financial system that's transparent and fair? What if we kicked out the cynics and gave medals to people who expose corruption? What if we gave women an equal voice with men? What if we slowed down to a pace that suited our souls? Now, if you take these hundred people that I just mentioned, what if they devoted a quarter of what they earned this year to ending extreme poverty in the world? They'd go down as heroes who saved, who saved the entire poverty on the planet. So my job over the last 50 years has been to go into some of the toughest areas of the world, see what's going on, and talk to people who are doing something about it and help them. And five years ago, I wouldn't have said what I'm going to say now. What I'm going to say now is that I believe that a safe and secure future for all of humanity is possible. And I want you to imply your imagination to this. Imagine if the streams ran clear and we could drink the water anywhere. Imagine if the earth regenerated and produced safe food for everybody to eat. Imagine if people learned to communicate instead of fight. Imagine if the air was safe to breathe, even in cities. Imagine if children were safe instead of scared. Imagine if women were in decision-making positions equally to men. Imagine if, if commerce and business had to produce fairly produced goods because customers insisted. Imagine if everywhere we went, we could connect with other people who felt like we do to build this kind of world. Now, five years ago, if you'd said to me this is utopia, I would have agreed. But now I don't, for the following reason. That there's a movement going on out there and it's way below the radar. The media haven't picked it up, but I bump into it every day. I spent part of this summer working with young social entrepreneurs from all over the world who assembled in Germany. 
and they came from Colombia, uh, Morocco, Kenya, Uganda, Egypt, Mauritius, Bosnia, Pakistan, India, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, Russia, Netherlands, Germany, and the UK. And what they wanted to learn was the skills, the hard skills, to make their projects work, their social entrepreneurial projects, where they wanted to know how to build a website, they wanted to know how to uh, communicate with the media, they wanted to know how to, um, how to build a business plan, how to raise money. But what they wanted to know from me was how to build a team that's based on trust, how to deal with the conflicts that arise when you are bold enough to do this, how to have the skills to get their message across. And the demand that's coming now from all over the world for this kind of course means that there were 2,000 applicants for this course. And now you can get similar courses in New York, just as you can in New Delhi. You can get them in Birmingham, UK, as much as you can in Birmingham, Alabama, in South Africa as in South America. There's demand all over the place for this. And it's not only from young people. There are mid-career professionals who are saying to themselves, success, money, paid the mortgage, happy family, it's not enough. It's not what I'm here for. One of them is a man called Anupam Jalote. He was one of the chief executives of India's largest telecom company. Very successful man. And at a certain point, he was sitting quietly in his garden. And a voice in his head said to him, do not disappoint your soul. And he suddenly realized, actually, I'm not doing what I want to do in my life. And what he wanted to do was produce cooking gas that people could use in any village in India. And so he set about it. He gathered uh, cow dung, basically, slurry, and produced an anaerobic digester that had a... He, he was so proud when he showed it to me, this beautiful blue flame. And now that can be built in any village in India, replacing wood replacing kerosene and so forth, which is so polluting. And the byproduct is he's got organic fertilizer that the local farmers loves, love, and he organizes them into collectives so that they can reforest <coughs> their lands. So people like him, and there are hundreds of thousands of them now, and, and the young people that I described to you, are, as I perceive it, a movement that is a bit like mushrooms coming up through concrete. It's bottom-up stuff. You wouldn't notice it if you didn't know it. But I know the quality of the people who are doing it. These are people who are courageous enough to give up, to chuck out the things that most of us crave. Uh, a good salary, uh, a mortgage paid off, uh, a good job that they can rely on, security. These kids are willing to look into the darkest parts of the world that surrounds them, <coughs> whether it's down the road in Newham or in Bangladesh, and see what the problem is, go right into it, see what needs doing, imagine a better future, and do it. And their energy is stunning. I can't get over it. They can connect with each other without even meeting at thousands of miles away because they recognize each other's energy. They've got a shorthand. They, they're onto the same thing. So they help each other. They know they can depend on each other to deliver when things get rough. And boy, do they deliver. Right now, they're cleaning up crime in the slums of Rio. They're asserting women's rights in Tahrir Square and Cairo as we speak. 
they're getting a computer education for young men in Kenya who are at risk of becoming terrorists. They're enabling scavenger children in the Philippines to get to school. And they're providing safe transport for young girls in Islamabad in Pakistan. I could go on all night telling you what they're doing. But to me, the reason I'm excited about this is because I haven't seen anything like this happening before. And what they've discovered is a secret. If the mantra of last century was, what can I get? The mantra of this century is, what can I give? Thank you.